Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and we are moving right along with part five of my series on Leonidas Polk. When we last left him, he was marching out of Kentucky into Tennessee. Once I finish with Polk, I am going to do another similar series for Winfield Scott Hancock, one of my absolute favorite Union generals, and by devoting a series to him, I hope he gets the recognition he deserves for being one of the best corps commanders of the war. On his way out of the Bluegrass State, he was elevated to the rank of Lieutenant General, and he also had gotten word that his family had escaped from New Orleans during its Union occupation and made it safely to Jackson, Mississippi. Polk had ruffled quite a few feathers in the Army, with many people having little confidence in his ability. The middle director of William Hardy's Corps, Dr. David Yandel, wrote to one of Davis's aides. He stated, Polk threatened wonders and was positively ferocious, but he can't be relied on. Bishop and Lieutenant General as he is, I saw enough of the old gray beard at Shiloh and Perryville to cause me to place no great confidence in him, and if Bragg isn't removed or Polk transferred to house duties, we will all go to the devil out here. Also on the return trip to East Tennessee, Braxton Bragg was called to meet with Davis to discuss the late campaign. Bragg placed the blame for the failure of the Kentucky campaign on Polk. Once Bragg returned to the Army, Polk was summoned by Davis to meet in conference with the President to discuss Kentucky. Polk likewise lambasted the Army commander for being a substandard general. Davis was caught between a rock and a hard place, made even more difficult when Bragg attempted to court-martial Polk for disobeying orders at Bardstown and Perryville. That attempt would fail. After leaving Richmond, where his family had met him from Jackson, they traveled to Raleigh to visit family members and then passed through Asheville, North Carolina. Polk deemed it a pleasant place and thought it far enough away from the fighting to keep his family safe. They rented a large house and Polk transferred 20 male slaves from his Mississippi plantation to Asheville to work. The now Army of Tennessee moved against Nashville by deploying around Murfreesboro, Tennessee. It was December and Jefferson Davis decided to visit the troops in the field, the first time he had done so in the Western Confederacy since the war began. The Army put on a parade for him and he convened with his generals over the weekend. The spiteful commanders remained amicable while the commander-in-chief was in their midst. The president left and Polk presided over the wedding of the famed partisan ranger John Hunt Morgan, who was 37, and his 22-year-old bride. The cavalryman had just received a commission to Brigadier General and had barely put the ring on his wife's finger before he rode off on another raid. December 31, 1862 opened with Polk's Confederate forces attacking the Union right at Murfreesboro, driving the blue troops in. But the maneuvers were breaking up portions of the brigades, and some units were thrown in piecemeal against the stubborn Federal units in the Round Forest. Union General Rosecrans' troops would pull out of the Round Forest later, and Polk would occupy it. But when the battle erupted again on January 2, 1863, Polk's brigades would again be driven out of the Round Forest. After the Battle of Stones River, the Army of Tennessee would break away from Murfreesboro and set up in Shelbyville to remain there well into 1863. Polk's time in Shelbyville was spent reprimanding a soldier for mistreating prisoners by not feeding them, helping to organize an unsuccessful attempt to capture Union Commander William S. Rosecrans, and meeting with a member of the Queen's Coldstream Guards, Arthur Fremantle. The summer saw Rosecrans come out of hibernation around Murfreesboro and Nashville and press Bragg's army at Shelbyville and Tullahoma. Bragg asked for advice from his corps commanders, and Polk suggested to withdraw toward Chattanooga, the vital railroad hub that held the Confederacy together. It was difficult for Bragg to do so. The early harvest would soon be upon them and leaving Middle Tennessee now would only allow the Yankees to benefit from the growing season. Ultimately, Bragg decided to retreat. As Polk moved over the mountains, he was preceded by the Lightning Brigade of Colonel John T. Wilder, who destroyed rail lines near the University of the South and burnt down many of the campus buildings. Polk and his men passed by the ruins of Polk's aspirations for a southern educational institution and made it to Chattanooga by mid-July. Union troops encamped on the grounds and, depending on which account you believe, used malls or gunpowder to destroy the cornerstone, hearing rumors that gold coins rested inside. While camped at Chattanooga, Polk's circle of friends became even smaller. He began to, in a way, turn on his longtime friend Jefferson Davis. In a letter he wrote, The truth is, I am somewhat afraid of Davis. I do not find myself willing to trust his judgment. I am afraid also of his forecast. 
he certainly has shown himself deficient in both qualities, and I do not feel like risking everything on the legacy or procedures of any man who has so many temptations to pull the trial of his individual strength to the extreme points. Davis is proud, self-reliant, and I fear stubborn. He is not quick to perceive coming events, and he is very apt to invest others, even the whole people, with the brief that things are possible which history has shown are not possible, nor even probable. Polk did not think such a mind should be allowed the untrammeled and final action of leading the Confederacy. After being pressured by Rosecrans' army outside of Chattanooga, the Army of Tennessee pulled back into northern Georgia, and Rosecrans followed. The two armies would clash along Chickamauga Creek, with the Confederates pushing in the Union regiments on September 19, 1863, and then prepare for an assault the next day that they hoped would ensnare the Federal forces. The night of September 19th became a den of confusion as Bragg organized his army into two wings after just recently reorganizing the whole army. Polk would command the right wing and James Longstreet, just recently sent from the Army of Northern Virginia, would command the left wing. Once Bragg decided on that strategy, the commanders had to be informed of the change. Fellow Corps Commander Daniel Harvey Hill was placed under Polk, who had worked together as equals on the 19th. Polk needed to inform Hill of the switch and pass by Hill's aide-de-camp on his way to his own headquarters. He told the officer that Hill was now placed under his command and to tell the Corps commander to come to Polk's headquarters to work out the details for attacks the next day. However, Hill could not be found, and Hill could not find Polk. This led to a host of inactivity in the morning as Polk's men sat down for breakfast instead of launching their daylight attack. Rumors swirled around camp and the country that Polk had been found sitting in a rocking chair on the porch of a farmhouse reading a newspaper instead of ensuring his wing's movements. But that has proven to be false. Polk worked tirelessly on the night of the 19th and into the morning of the 20th to get his orders to all of his commanders, yet they still did not act when they were supposed to, partly because of Polk's vague orders to attack when in position. When Polk's wing did attack, it met with little success, unlike Longstreet's attack which moved through the Union battle line and the entire Federal Army began to move back through the mountains, except for the Rock of Chickamauga, General George Thomas, who put up a stubborn fight on Snodgrass Hill. Eventually, though, all Union forces would withdraw from the battlefield and Bragg would not pursue. Instead, the Confederate Army would secure the mountainous terrain of Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge as Rosecrans' forces occupied Chattanooga. It was at this point that Polk, Simon Bolivar, Buckner, D.H. Hill, and Longstreet conspired to oust Bragg from the command of the Army of Tennessee. Letters were sent to the President, the Secretary of War, and Robert E. Lee, informing them of Bragg's inability to command and the disasters due in part to his incompetence. Bragg would become irate at the accusations and got rid of many of the dissatisfied commanders. Longstreet would be sent north to attempt the capture of Knoxville, Tennessee, which had come under Union occupation by Ambrose Burnside early in September. Within days of reaching Chattanooga, Bragg put Polk under arrest and sent him to Atlanta to await a court of inquiry into his disobedience on the morning of September 20th. Polk would arrive in Atlanta on October 1st. He would stay with John Sidney Thrasher, the general manager of the Confederate Press Association, who enjoyed having the general with him in order to have the inside scoop for news stories about the army. Soon after Polk's arrival, John Bell Hood, recovering from losing a leg at Chickamauga, would be another house guest for Thrasher. Polk entertained guests at the house and began a series of correspondence criticizing Bragg and calling for his replacement by General Lee or another capable commander. Jefferson Davis sought to placate his fighting generals and got Bragg to drop the charges, but Polk refused to serve under Bragg. Davis then went on a speaking tour to boost the morale of the Confederacy and met with Polk on three separate occasions. After the first time, he went by rail to Chattanooga to address the troops and speak with the public. He assured them that Bragg was a great commander and said not to pay attention to those hurling insults at the army commander. By the time Davis made it back to Atlanta, Polk was there to confront the president about his words and his insinuation that the critics of Bragg were off base. Davis assured him that he was misquoted and the two sat down for another discussion. It was determined that Polk would head to Mississippi to replace General Hardy, who had been under the command of Joseph E. Johnston in that state. Hardy, in turn, would take over Polk's old command. In early November, he was off for his new assignment, but the family had been struck by another tragedy. Another attempted arson took place at the Asheville home. Not as severe as the one in Sewanee, but it still frightened the family. 
They suspected that one of the male slaves named Josh was part of the plot. Polk was bent on hanging the poor man, but then thought differently and decided to sell him at the slave market in Augusta, Georgia. However, on the way to the market, Josh escaped. Polk arrived at Enterprise, Mississippi at his new headquarters, but would be struck by an inflammation of his lungs, a recurring problem since his time at West Point. Fanny was there to doctor him and to bring him out of his sickbed using herbal medicine. He got out of his sickbed to only be compounded by headaches in the form of military obstacles in his district. Thousands of soldiers waited in his area, paroled from Vicksburg, and pledged not to take up arms against the United States until formally exchanged. Many young men exempted because of their family's wealth and slaves, avoided military service, and deserters swarmed over the whole region. Even worse, Union armies were pressing in on the region. Before the end of 1863, with the disasters for the Confederacy that were Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge, Bragg was replaced and Joseph E. Johnston took his place. This put Polk in command of a new department, the Department of Alabama, Mississippi, and East Louisiana. As 1864 dawned, Polk strove to bring together the scattered force under his command. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please consider joining the Patreon page, buying a t-shirt from the Teespring store, and sharing the video to get the word out about the channel. Thank you all again, and have a great day. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the hard land To educate the world is his mission A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian